Yes, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, welcoming you once again to talk about business communication. And all of us know that central to business communication is our customer service. Early in my career, I was advised, become an expert in your niche. Well, I may not have done that, but our guest today is someone who has, Dr. Joseph Michelli, known worldwide for his speeches and his books on customer service, what he likes to call the customer experience. I'm going to let him introduce himself because this is what he says about himself on his Amazon page. I am Joseph Michelli, a business consultant, professional speaker and author. I consult for and write about transformational leadership and ways to deliver extraordinary employee and customer service. And one of my favorite phrases of his is environment of caring. I mentioned his books. This one is on the UCLA health system. This one on the Zappos experience. This one on Mercedes Benz. And so we'll have time for the interview. I can't mention <laughs> the rest of his books. He's a marvelous author. He's an incredible, inspiring speaker. He's a tremendous individual. And it's my privilege now to welcome Joseph Michelli. Hello, Dr. Joseph Michelli. Hello. You know, I, I'll do my own introduction by saying I'm simply somebody who's inspired by Bill Lampton. That's my, my introduction right there. Oh, my goodness. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> As you and I used to say on radio. That's right. That's a exactly. wrap. That's right. Joseph, you've had a, a fascinating career. I know, of course, of your background in radio. You have a PhD in psychology. And then I believe it was in 2004, you started writing best-selling business books, mainly focusing on the customer experience. What was it initially that prompted you to delve into this topic and become the leading authority in the world on the customer experience? Well, I think because we've traveled similar paths, I, I certainly have worked in the world of communication and trying to be an effective communicator. It's interesting to me, one of the areas where I saw people struggling to communicate and forge a relationship through that communication was between vendors and companies, between companies and customers. There was a lot of business op opportunities to figure out how to help people sell their vision to their people on how to deliver great experiences to customers, sell customers on why I'm different. How do I communicate to a customer that I truly care about you and I care for you all at the same time? So for some reason, I was, uh, I was drawn to the notion that of all the things we can talk about, it's how can we serve one another and how can we encourage brands and companies to work together to provide, I think, this service that distinguishes themselves from their competition. You could have selected from probably 50 to 100 leading companies to study and to write about and to speak about. How is it you happened to choose the companies that you did? Well, I was really fortunate in my career to start working with a guy by the name of Johnny Yokoyama, the owner of the Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington. And Johnny really reminded me a lot of my dad, honestly, he's a very wholesome, kind man. And he gave me a chance to uh, work with him and write about his company. There had been a video that had been shared about his company called Fish, and it was very popular. And people, you know, were seen throwing fish in the video and there's this energy around this business and, and Johnny knew that that a lot of what the video communicated really wasn't what was at the soul of his brand so the video would say choose your attitude make their day these kinds of things and those were more byproducts of being on purpose in service to another human being there was one principle called play and Johnny would say if, if you just set out to play in business you probably aren't going to be around very long but if you set out for a really meaningful purpose, play happens. People spontaneously connect with each other in a wholesome way. So Johnny Okuyama let me have that opportunity. And from there, I was fortunate enough to meet people at Starbucks and Ritz Carlton Hotel Company and just kind of parlayed a career around sharing the greatness of their experiences. One of the things that has impacted 
customer service so much is technology. I remember so much a good number of years ago when I attended a presentation someone was giving on customer service. And they had, a, at that time, probably before PowerPoint, they had a paper handout with some multiple choice questions on it. And one of the questions was, if you offend a customer, how many people will they be likely to tell? And I think the highest answer was something like between eight and 12. Well, because of technology now, you don't tell a couple of dozen people if your customer service, someone's customer service dissatisfy you, you can tell tens of thousands and even millions because of the internet. So technology, talk a little bit please about what you advise companies on the impact of technology and how they should respect it and even use it wisely. Well, you know, even a medium like radio, which I grew up on, used to be a staple along with three channels of television and a few local newspapers. And that's really where brands tried to communicate with their customers and form impressions for their customers. Today, the communication happens on social platforms. I say everybody has a platform. So everybody has an audience. You should assume that that person who just walked in your door, uh, who, who looks like they were, you know, uh, couldn't possibly have a friend in the world has tens of thousands of people that they can access as part of their network. You just have to assume it. And you have to assume they have a video camera and they're ready to take a video of the customer experience interaction and post that uh, on their favorite platform. So today, customer choice and customer voice are unlike any other time in history. And because of that, brands really have to understand that A, you have to make it easy for people through technology. And B, when people choose to interact with a human being, that human being had better care for them. You know, the bulk of all customer complaints come as a result of what happens between people, not that the product failed. About 62% of all complaints filed against a brand come because a person mistreated them, disrespected them, oversold them, didn't follow through, you name it. But ultimately, it's a real dance between technology and people. And if you don't have the right technologies to make life easy for customers, then they'll just go somewhere else where they can have it expedited through an app. There's some good news and some bad news regarding technology and customer service. The bad news is that people can and will report what they think is terrible customer service, lack of customer care, lack of concern. But the good news is that there are many people who will take an opportunity to go online and say, I was at this store today, and I really recommend that you go there. The clerks were helpful, they were courteous, the price was right, and I went out of there feeling very satisfied. I'll have to admit, Joseph, that I've done both. Truly, when I felt justified, I have lambasted someone who I, I was sure did not care about me as a customer. On the other hand, far more often, I will say this is a place you want to go because I was satisfied. So is there any other advice that you give your customers about technology? Well, I mean, I think one of the things, your focus on helping people share their story and communicate effectively, I mean, really, in the end of the day, we are storytellers, okay? That is what human beings are. It is how we passed on our oral tradition for, for generation and eons. And we're going to continue to tell stories and whether we're going to do it in 140 characters or now Twitter at 280 characters, you know, we're going to tell those stories. We have to, you know, I often say I have about as much time as I have money, uh, not enough of either most of the time, right? So if I'm going to invest my time with your brand, give me a story to tell. And I also say that brands are really what we want people to say about us when we're not around. So what do you want people to say? And then build your experiences, build your service delivery around that. So that when you do troll social media, seeing what they're saying about you, you're going to hear the very thing that you wanted to be known for. And that's what I think great brands do. And it's how they build great brands and leaders inspire their people to realize that we are living in this little corner of the world, but we have a chance to touch people's lives today. You know, we can be more than the products we sell. We can create something around the consumer that if it's only for a moment uplifts them or inspires them or makes them comfortable. Whatever it is you're trying to shoot for, uh, hopefully you'll see it in your social media and it's a result of your crafting the right message. And if you craft it well, people like yourself, Bill, will share it online. 
I want to explore for a minute your methodology in studying the customer service of a company that you deal with. Uh, a long time ago, there was a novelist, Edna Ferber, and someone said about her that uh, she really did not do the research that she needed to do. And the quip was that Edna Ferber one time said to a uh, an airplane pilot fly low over Texas. I want to write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure that that's not the uh, Joseph Michelli experience. So, for example, as I looked at and read and reviewed the Mercedes Benz book, this was not pop reading at all. So, explain to us how you dig into the core of what people are doing in customer service and then make your observations and recommendations. Well, this is, that's a really great example. I was uh, for Mercedes Benz. And this is a kind of a sad time in my life. My wife was near the end of her life. She had just a few uh, months, uh, weeks to live literally. And I had to make a decision if I was going to honor my commitment to this brand, but it worked out. I was able to go and do this event and then uh, be with her at the end of her life. But as I went to the very first event with Mercedes Benz, literally what I did was bring some of the best minds from Ritz Carlton, from Zappos and other brands to Mercedes Benz headquarters. And we did that along with the CEO of Mercedes Benz. And we had a round table discussion of what are other brands doing outside of automotive that are creating a great experience um, because automotive has never been known for creating such a great experience. Based on that one interaction where I was hired essentially to create this round table discussion, I worked with the CEO, got involved with the brand for multiple years, helped develop a brand immersion center that helped infuse the spirit of the brand for all of the dealers. Ultimately, four years later, uh, along that journey with the brand, wrote a book from the inside as a consultant, but also as somebody who had journeyed with them in their efforts to transform the brand. So that's a pretty good example. It was about a two and a half, three years uh, into the process before the book came out. Thank you for that explanation. You know, we have seen, and we will continue to see, the disappearance of many companies that were we thought in our earlier years were around forever. And almost every day now we pick up the paper and we see where those companies, those names are disappearing. And probably 20 years from now, nobody will even know that they were around. To what extent does their disappearance relate to the type of customer service that they were offering? Well, you know, I think it's going to be just a natural uh, attrition. If you look at the Fortune 500 since its origin, there are about 60 companies, I think, that have maintained themselves at one point or another throughout that whole journey. Um, and then you've seen the emergence of the Amazons and other brands, Starbucks, that wasn't even around at, at that time. I think what starts to happen is those brands that are most relevant to the lives of customers who figure out what customers need, not just the products, but the amount of effort and the lifestyle needs of a customer, those brands are going to continually hopefully be nimble enough to respond. The problem is sometimes you get so, so large and you get so comfortable that you don't actually continue to re, re uh, create yourself in the eye through the eyes of the customer. So I think that, you know, you know there's going to be a constant attrition of that. Um, I don't think everything will go online. I'm not the, harbinger of, you know, we're going to be cooped up in our house all the time and we're just waiting for brown packages to show up at the door. I think humans are going to need to get out of their homes, but when they do so, they're going to make decisions about what is it that causes me to want to, to do this? How much have they reduced my effort and made my life easy about getting my needs met and having a memorable experience with the story to tell? As a professional speaker, you have seen changes in how we present our our speeches and how they're preserved. There probably was a time when your speeches were being circulated on uh, eight track tapes and maybe other formats. And then not only are those tracks not um, available anymore, there's nothing to play them on. <laughs> so uh, we've all experienced that. And suppose for example, 15 years ago, someone had come to me and said, there's this great new company, Blockbuster, and if you invest in it, you'll be set for life. Well, that was fine, as long as those tapes were what were needed sure. for our 
entertainment, our movies, the documentaries we wanted to see. But formats are going to change, and sometimes that impacts the companies that we're doing them, right? Absolutely. And I think that the key here is, you know, there's going to be those breakthrough technologies and you're going to have to adapt to that. But really the problem for Blockbuster was they didn't really care about the customers. The late fee, you know, processes that they had in place uh, just really weren't conducive to the average customer that, you know, be kind, rewind strategies that were involved. And I think ultimately you saw brands like Netflix come around and say, you know, for example, right now, you could you could quit Netflix uh, easily, and they make it incredibly easy to stop doing business with them. They also make it really incredibly easy to start doing business again if you ever do stop. They've got all of your mem all the movies that you want to watch still in queue when you resume your relationship with them. So I, I think what you're seeing is brands that understand how do we take the pain out of the human experience. And the more that we do that, the more likely we're adding value and adding value is what customers want. Really, you know, businesses are nothing more than creating value, being able to market that value, to deliver that value, to make sure that you've sold it to the customer. So it's a sales arm and then ultimately to make enough profit to remain in business. Every one of us who teaches customer service, seminars, speeches, write about it. We definitely are going to talk about the starting at the top that it's the CEO, it's the manager, it's the owner, it's, it's the person who is right there. And I, I liked it when you talked about in the Zappos experience that the CEO had his desk, his cubicle out in the middle of everybody else. And it's experiences like that, that demonstrate that there's not this ivory tower that we once used to talk about. That's mm -hmm. important, isn't it? It really is. I mean, servant leadership is critically important to create service brands. I mean, if you don't think that you're in business to serve those around you, that they're in business to serve you, then how in the heck do you encourage them to serve others? I mean, it just it, it's illogical to think that you should be served as a leader of an organization and that that will somehow communicate to your people how important it is for them to serve others. Uh, it just, it, it defies logic. So uh, yeah, I think Tony Shea is a great example. He's a billionaire. He lives, he, his office is in an open cubicle. Um, he doesn't have a close, you know, an open door policy. He has a no door policy. So literally I think making yourself accessible, uh, caring about others and demonstrating your commitment to them. It is what leadership is all about. And your teaching and even in your writing, you use the acronym LEAD, L-E-A-D, in your training. What do those letters stand for? It's, it's, thank goodness I know, huh? This would get to be a really uh, daunting question. Listen, empathize, add value, and delight. So listen is the important part of all communication. We think that speaking is really critical to communication, but if we don't create that space to understand, then we really can't share much of value. And then listening for understanding is the key to that first letter. And E is slightly different. It's, it talks about empathy. And for me, empathy is listening to an emotional truth or listening for the human condition. So if I listen to understand the facts, uh, you know, just the facts, and then if I can get past the understanding of the thing to what must it feel like to have experienced that thing, or what is the human condition, how might a person react to that thing, and connect with that. Um, and then I have to add value because truly technology can replace us all if we don't find a way to uniquely create value. And then the final thing is delight. And for me, delight is just that little flourish of saying something like, thank you with an authentic sincerity about it, or we appreciate your business, uh, or, or just smiling at a person as they leave because it's an opportunity to lift their spirit up, albeit for a moment. Uh, those are the things that I focus on. Listen, empathize, add value, and then delight. One of the things that I've said for many years is that, and you've said it, is that when a customer comes in with a complaint, if you will genuinely listen to that customer, it is amazing what will happen. If you try to defend your position, it just escalates the war. I had a, um, a head of a company one time tell me that he decided that when a customer came in with a complaint, that this company head owner would no longer try to say you're wrong or here's why you're wrong or you're mistaken or here's our policy or all those things. He simply would say, tell me about it. Tell me yeah. what's the problem and tell me more. He said eventually, and this, this was um, 
he called it non-committal listening because he wasn't committing to any kind of stance. He was just truly showing the empathy you're talking about. And Joseph, he said, after a while, he had people after 10 minutes say to him, oh, I'm so sorry I bothered you. You're a busy person. I, yeah. I shouldn't be taking your time with this trivial problem. Of course, you have to be sincere in that listening. It's, it, uh, it has to be, and, and this is a word that some people say is overworked, but it's not in my books. I love the word authentic. You must be authentic. Yeah, and I, I just love your example, too. And I think that the sincerity of his listening, people, you know, extinguishes the, the necessity and the urgency to keep talking. After a while, you kind of say, okay, I've got it out of my system. And, and, then, and then you can move to resolution. And the more you ask for more, the more opportunities you have not only to fix a problem for that individual, but to look to see if there's a systemic problem that requires a process change. Uh, and you can't learn about that if you shut it down. Joseph, what a fascinating time with you this has been. I know that our viewers and also our podcast listeners will want to get in touch with you. So please give us your contact information. Well, sadly, I'm all over the web. So you can find me almost at any turn at joseph at josephmichelli.com. That's an email address for me or simply my web address is josephmichelli.com. And the spelling of that is J-O-S-E-P-H-M-I-C-H-E-L-L-I.com. Thank you. And since Joseph has given his contact information, I'm delighted to share mine as well. Biz, that's B-I-Z, the Biz Communication Guy. So logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. I invite you to visit my website, review my services for corporations and individuals, sign up for my newsletter, and let's get in touch so that I can find out your communication needs and how I can assist you in solving them. Joseph, any closing words for us about the customer experience? Well, you know, I think we're placed on this planet to help one another. That's fundamentally what I believe. I think that the more we can encourage <clears throat> otherness for brands and for individuals, the better off we're all going to be. Um, I thank you for sharing your audience and your time with me. You've demonstrated your otherness over and over and over again on behalf of my brand. And I'm grateful for this opportunity today. So thank you, Bill, and uh, much continued success. And, and thanks for making American companies better and the communicators within them better communicators on behalf of their customers. Joseph, you are just as gracious in person as you are in your books and on the platform. And that's no surprise to me. Thank you. And thanks to all of you again who joined us on the video portion of the Biz Communication Show. And thanks to those who were with us on podcast. Be with us again next week, please. When the Biz Communication Guy brings you people who will help you in your sales, your motivation, your customer service, your marketing, your management, your leadership, and yes, your profits as well. Thanks again for being with us.